So matter and antimatter always come in pairs. Right, you know, if you if you generate like you have some process, some interaction, some collider experiment, you know, you do whatever, you make a bunch of matter. You're also going to make a bunch of antimatter. You're going to make its partner, same mass, same same spin, whatever, but opposite charge. All right, and if they ever touch, kablooey, you know, they they get transformed into pure energy. Where's all the antimatter? Really, where where to go? As far as we can tell, and we've looked really, really hard, our universe is full of matter. There's no antimatter stars, antimatter gas clouds, antimatter galaxies, antimatter sectors. Sector A, the antimatter sector over. They don't go over there because if you touch it, you die. There's none of that. There's no antimatter in our universe. But if matter and antimatter always come in pairs, where's the other half in our universe? We think, we think something weird happened in the early universe. Some sort of interaction, some sort of exotic process, some sort of thing happened when our universe was very, very young to cause an imbalance, to cause a shift, to, to break the relationship, the standard relationship between matter and antimatter. We don't know exactly what this process is. We don't know exactly how long this process took. It didn't have to be like super duper efficient. It's something like in excess of one matter particle for every uh, nine billion pairs. So you get, or nine billion, not one billion. If you make one billion and one matter in, or you make, I'll, I swear I'll get through this. You don't need a big imbalance. And no, I'm not going to go back to edit it out. You get the raw stuff here. If you make a billion matter and antimatter particles, they're going to annihilate, release pure energy. And then you just get one extra, you get one bonus bit of matter. That's all you need to explain the entire contents of our universe. It had to happen early on. Otherwise, we would start to see it in some of our observations of the early universe. Uh, it had to involve exotic processes because not exotic processes that we can do like in the laboratory or in everyday life are perfectly symmetric in any matter, matter and any matter. So we had to be weird and it had to satisfy certain conditions. It had to satisfy, it had to break, it had to break some laws. It had to break some laws of the universe. It had to break uh, a law that says the number, the amount of matter participating in a reaction stays the same in a reaction, in a, in a fundamental process. You had to, right off the bat, break one of the fundamental rules of the universe that we understand, which is if you have, if you start an interaction, like, okay, boys, let's, let's get it together. Let's, let's start our party. And you've got five matter particles and two antimatter particles. You put them in the box, you shake the box, you, you smash the box against another box. You do your experiment and then you open it up. You're going to find five matter particles and two antimatter particles. Whatever you start with, you're going to end with. Now, these might be different matter particles, a different combination of antimatter particles, but the counts, the counts will stay the same. So, of course, step one, if you want to produce more matter than antimatter, is to break this rule where you say you go in with five matter and two antimatter. Mm, you come out with, with six matter and, and, and one antimatter. Now you think might think that's it. That isn't that like the only rule? Isn't that the entire game? Well, no. And the problem is, is that there's another rule of the universe. Another rule of the universe is that charge, electric charge, it stays the same. If you count up all the charges in your inputs, and then they go in and do the interaction and then come out, the total amount of electric charge at the end will be the same. So if you're able to violate the first rule and say, no, okay, I've got more antimatter, or I've got more matter coming out than I put in, because charge is, the you know, conservation of charge is also a rule in our universe, there'll be another process happening in mirror 
right there, whether you like it or not, that will correct the imbalance. So all your hard work will be for naught. And yet, so you might think you're done if you satisfied these two challenges where you've made more matter and you haven't allowed the universe to compensate for it by by conserving charge, by making sure charges stay the same. So there's a new, there has to be a third rule. There has to be a third rule. This has to happen outside of equilibrium. So equilibrium is, is a jargon term in physics. It means that uh, all the things that can happen do happen in equal amounts. That's a super lazy, rough way of defining equilibrium, but I think it works for us. So that even if you had a process that made more antimatter, that broke the conservation of charge, if your system is in equilibrium, then those processes won't get a lot of chances to operate. And opposite processes will, will get some more chances. And at the end of the day, still, you're going to have the exact same amount of matter and antimatter. So the only way this can work is if the universe, if the early universe is out of equilibrium. It's undergoing a transition. It's changing character where in the moment of transition or the, the very narrow window of time where the transition takes place, the universe is not in 100% equilibrium. There might be some exotic processes and forces going on that break the conservation of charge, that break the cons conservation of uh, matter and antimatter and produces a universe that is not evenly split. Now, like I said, we don't fully understand this process. These are the conditions that the process must be satisfied, that must satisfy in order to produce the universe that we see. Other than that, we've got some ideas. None of them are really great. This is an unsolved problem in physics. I hope you liked this video. If you would like to see more, go to patreon.com slash PMSR. It's how I keep these things and all my education outreach activities going. Uh, and you can also like, share, and subscribe. And uh, I'll, see you. I'll see you next week. Think about some antimatter. Don't touch it.